Just put start. Okay. Great. Okay. So for for today, what we're gonna be talking about is sections eight point one to eight point four. Um, the chapter th these sections are can be a bit much as well. Um, uh, and uh, some are quite new. Uh, so uh, let's see where it takes us. So this time I did an R markdown file instead of slides. So uh, yeah. Let me just put in some of the learning objectives. So basically for the three, for the four sections that I'm gonna talk about, uh, the first part is really about the impact of uh, sparsity on numerical computation. So sparsity here, meaning that the matrix has tons of zeros uh, and uh, how, how, it, how it could be advantageous and how it could be disadvantageous. Mm, the next thing, section 8.2 and 8.3, are really about uh, obtaining eigenvalues, but they're more they're more about obtaining specific eigenvalues rather than have that rather than getting all of the eigenvalues of some large matrix. Okay, so uh, the idea here is to have a targeted uh, approach towards obtaining eigenvalues, and then finally in section 8.4 is to start what is called the a class of methods which are called Krylov methods or Krylov methods. Um, and the idea behind Krylov methods uh, sort of like are for is at least foresh foreshadowed in in 8.2 and 8.3. So uh, Krylov methods uh, essentially what they do is to replace a complicated space with a not very complicated space. And in that not complicated space uh, is obtained through a recursion. So I think roughly uh, this this how I would think about it roughly. Okay. So let me just put on some of the highlights for section 8.1. Uh, there's really not so much theory here. Mainly, the section is about how how sparse matrices are stored. So the storage for this is really figuring out what the non-zero entries are and where they are located. That's it. So in effect, you have the address, the IJ entry that is non-zero, and then the the Julia stores the location, the IJ entry, not just the actual IJ entry, but the I and the J for the non non zero entry of the matrix. Um, and then they also demonstrate to a, through a couple of examples, I, I believe around three examples, showing dramatic improvements when you use sparse matrices. The storage is uh, is minimized a lot, and then the computational time uh, could be reduced a lot. So in that sense, this is probably one of the main advantages of using sparse matrices. Okay. Uh, however, there are some disadvantages with working with sparse matrices. Uh, one of a couple of them involve regular things that we would usually use such as matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication can, in certain cases, destroy this sparse structure. Uh, in particular, when you look at 8.2 and 8.3, you we will be looking at matrices that are raised to a power. So we're multiplying the matrix by itself. And uh, there's a tendency, even if we start with a sparse matrix, uh, multiplying that sparse matrix by itself, can induce non-sparsity. And um, another thing is that when you have, when you do LU factorization, so when you when you do, when you try to solve systems of linear equations uh, and you will encounter, or you will use LU factorization in that setting, even if you have a sparse matrix, the L and the U may not necessarily be sparse. So that's another thing to uh, pay attention to. And there's there are examples in the section that, that talk about, or at least that demonstrate uh, these things. 
And then there, there's a final example in the section that talks about the trade-offs with respect to the error and the computation time when using sparse matrices. It's specifically when you use a sparse representation of a sparse matrix and a dense representation of a sparse matrix. The difference between these two is that a dense representation of a sparse matrix, uh, what, what, what that means is that the zeros are actually recorded. So you know, you, you store the fact that a particular entry of the matrix that happens to be zero is actually zero. And you, you actually devote space, computer space for, for that. Uh, for a sparse representation, you don't, you don't even put that, uh, you don't even include that. You only needed to know where the non-zero entries are located and what they are. But for a dense representation, you also, not only do you have an idea of the, the non-zero entries, you also actually know that the zero entries are represented as zeros uh, in the computer. And the last example sh shows sort of like that there's a possibility that the errors are, yeah, the errors of a computation uh, might be slightly larger when you use a sparse representation, but the benefit is that you have uh, better computational times. Um, I think it's this part here. Yeah. So you have the time for a sparse solve and the time for a dense solve, and then you have the sparse error and the dense solve. So as you can see, there's this is minus 16 here and this is minus 18. So roughly the, these are okay, but uh, it's something to uh, to be mindful of. Oops, oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Now the next uh, thing that I wanted to point out is that the the section is really aim aiming towards the fact that we have to be uh, we have to pay attention to implementations of algorithms and make sure that they are sparse aware to some extent. And in terms of what things are new in Julia. Um, one is this num the number of non-zeros, counting the number of non-zeros in a matrix. And then you have this part. This is useful, especially when you want a dense representation of a sparse matrix. Why you would want it is mainly for, you know, I, I think it's for partly for benchmarking and partly uh, to be able to access older commands that rely on a dense representation, or at least those commands that have no um uh are not sparse aware okay so that might happen and i think there are examples of that in the book as well uh another command is this summary size uh command which is really determining the uh memory that is allocated to um, an object uh and then spy is a uh, visual representation of a sparse matrix, which uses a lot of these colors. Okay, so it's quite nice. And there's an FNC specific, yeah, I think F SPY is FNC specific, if I'm not mistaken, but I didn't, I forgot the FNC here. The other one is this SP RAND SIM. Ah, I think this should be RAND SIM rather than RAND the SM, which, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it alone. So, um uh for this one uh this is this is about forming a matrix a uh, random matrix with with spec with specified um eigenvalues if i'm not mistaken yeah this is used in just an example but not really used as thoroughly throughout the chapter and then there's a formatting uh, command that is involving printf. I think this should be reminiscent of C kind of stuff. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. And then the one that is used a lot is this igs command. Okay, so we'll see the different. Um, so this is a sparse aware implementation of uh, of finding eigenvalues of specified uh, number. Okay, and uh, if you want 
the largest ones or the smallest ones, you could do it using eggs. And then there's something that is relatively new in terms of the plotting is the LaTeX string. I think those are the newer, new-ish kind of commands here in Julia for this section. And, and then this part, I think I mentioned in the Slack uh, workspace, but um, something that I noticed, at least for, for, my, for my case, is that it really takes a lot of time to really load uh, some of the matrices, some of the JLD2 files, because they have to download it from, the, from, from some other website. So what I did was to download the local file first, and then make sure that it's in the same directory as my R markdown file, and then just use load later on. Okay, so this could be annoying for for people with slow internet connections. So, so for me, the the book is actually slow sometimes to load. So so this is something to uh to take note of. The other thing is that if the Wait, what do you mean? Which parts slow to, to load? So the book itself actually is slow to load for me sometimes. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so it's an internet, I think it's an internet connection. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you want to, if in case you are not able to, in case there's a command in the book that has a JLD2 file, but you don't know where it comes from, chances are it might have come from, from you might have to attach this uh, prefix to the to the file so that you could uh, load it so in case this happens to you okay. now I'll, I'll i'll jump to some of the exercises in 8.1 just to just to get a sense of what sort of like the main points are and some of the commands that which were used so the first exercise is about the small world matrix in demo 8.1.2 we are asked to find the density of powers of a and then afterwards to look at the um, sort of like this a measure of sparsity for lnu for an lu decomposition of a so the density here means really the number of non-zeros divided by the uh by the size of the matrix okay or it is the product of the column the number of columns and the number of rows of the matrix okay and you should also do this for the for a qr factorization or something something to that effect okay so i'll i'll just point out that again this layout is something that we we've seen before. Uh, I think the new part here is this size part. So you could adjust the size of the of the image. Um, the other thing that is new here is this spy command, okay, which is specific to visualizing these sparse matrices, and then this LaTeX string command that allows you to write something that looks like this, which is quite classy as well, quite nice. Uh, but I haven't been able to work out how to put a space in between density and uh, A square or you can, maybe that, sorry. You could use the, is this in like in math mode for LaTeX? So you'd have yeah, to do like I, I, the double backspace or the yeah. quad quad function yeah that, that i didn't know i didn't do the quad one but i tried the double backspace it gives me an error so i think there has oh. to be an escape. <laughs> because if you notice here you have a slash slash here so i i think there's an escape character you have to escape the the meaning of slash slash or something like that so i mm. i I didn't put in a lot of time for that anymore but but this is in sort of like math mode and then there's sort of like a pointer, like a, do a dollar density to point to the actual value of uh, density, which you, is you actually use quite latex, cool. latex literal. Sorry, you didn't use. You couldn't use latex literals. I, I think so. There's a special type uh, called you know you use you use the L and then quote it makes a link with oh yeah literal. He he yeah. uses it somewhere in the book, just like random, like what what does that mean? Yeah. Look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the L. Yeah, you're right. L and then quotation marks, right? Yeah, yeah that yeah. that could also work. Yeah, I I think the nice thing here is that you I don't know if the L one could do this pointing thing, 
So that's the. I don't know either. That's a good point. That's, yeah, the, the, that's the, the that's the thing that is interesting about this part. Yeah, that's true. We'll have to test it. Yeah. So you're right. Thanks about that L thing. Yeah. yeah I was wondering L. the same thing. Oh, it says use percent dollar sign instead of dollar sign. Then it'll do interpolation for you. So it will work. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. So there. Uh, some things to think about for the for the sort of like the design of a of a picture. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The 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 there's really nothing new here in the sense of uh it uses a, the 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 commands in uh, in the section, but I, I pointed out some of the quite nice things that you could do, and the result is probably not very surprising. Uh, as you have more and more powers of uh of the matrix A, effectively A to the eight is non-sparse already. It's all, all it's dense already. So that's uh something to to remember about um matrix multiplication and how it could destroy sparsity. And you might feel that why would we be interested in A to the eighth? Well, in the next sections, you will see situations where you really have to do these kinds of calculations to be able to find eigenvalues of a large matrix. Yeah. By the way, speaking of that, does, he mentions that matrix multiplication is faster with these sparse matrices, but it doesn't really say anything about how it's done. Is there something, or did he, and I just missed it? Mm, he didn't say much about it, I think. it's. It's more demonstrating that the that this matrix multiplication may not necessarily preserve sparsity. That's about it. Yeah, I don't think they went into the nitty gritty of okay. Maybe there's nothing special. It, yeah, maybe it's just a matter of organizing your yeah multiplications. Yeah. Okay. And I think the rest I'll I'll skip it for the moment. Uh, it's really just doing these kinds of calculations and showing that uh it's it's still quite sparse no the, this lu factorization is still quite sparse not so bad uh for the qr one i i forgot to put the the calculation but the qr factorization could also be done and you could calculate the density in pretty much the same way yeah so but but i think the the main point is really this uh showing this kind of picture uh, and having that at the back of your mind because you'll see you'll see it again in 8.2 and 8.3 okay okay and then there's this exercise in 8.1.6 where you're asked to look into eigenvalues like use the built-in eigenvalue command uh to find targeted eigenvalues um I don't know anything about this part, Helmholtz equation for wave propagation. So uh, I'll leave it alone. Uh, but what matters is that there's a matrix that that is inspired by this equation. And this matrix has this uh, form that you see here. It's a, I don't know why it's called a Poisson matrix, but it's a Poisson thing. And then minus K squared times I. And uh where you're asked to set n equals to 50 and then look at k equals one. And then you can see that the matrix is actually a 50 square by 50 square sparse matrix. Okay, kind of looks like this, okay. And then uh, you're asked to find the density, the size, find the four largest and four smallest eigenvalues because there will be 2,500 uh, eigenvalues here. So, the the command that does it that does all of the eigenvalues is called eigvals e i g v a l s and it will choke here like it will give you an error so well so here you can see the size of the matrix the uh the density the dense as you can see it's uh not very dense uh and then the eigs command allows you to specify how many eigenvalues you want. It also allows you to specify uh, that you want the four largest ones. So this is largest magnitude, okay? There's also a version that is called LR, 
that means that this the this is the largest real part. They really didn't distinguish between those two. You'll see LR, I think, later in the chapter, but uh LM is the one that is about the largest magnitude. Okay. And I pops out the eigen eigenvalue and the eigenvectors. Um so the eigenvalues uh, could be seen here. Okay, so these are the four largest eigenvalues, and then if you want the smallest eigenvalues, you use SM, uh, and then you see what, you, and then you can see the thing here. Okay, and then the the remaining exercise is a curious one. So the remaining exercise is to, is asking you to find a value of K for which A would have exactly three negative eigenvalues. So this might, so, so I, I did this uh, by trial and error. I'm not exactly sure how to do this analytically to, you know, to find bounds for K to do, to do this. Uh, so after some trial and error, I found that 2.5 might work. And if you want to check that you have exactly three negative eigenvalues. This is also something that is vexing. So what I did was to find the 100 eigenvalues, which are, have the smallest magnitude. But if you can, if you look at the vector of eigenvalues, you would notice that it doesn't arrange it in terms of um, uh, smallest in the sense that you have very negative, I don't know if they mean very negative or very small in absolute value. So yeah, so I, I so I, I so here I think they wanted negative. So three negative I exactly three negative eigenvalues. So if you look at the if you look at this vector of eigenvalues, uh it seems that we have three. It seems we have three, but we don't actually see all of the eigenvalues here. So I'm not very sure if we if I've gotten exactly three negative eigenvalues, but it seems like we we got them. Uh, the the vexing part here is that um, the arrangement of the eigenvalues here. So they they arranged it as like minus one. It's in terms of absolute value. Okay, so that's yeah, so the, it's meant to be in terms of magnitude, right? That's what L. Yeah. LM, that's what you use. LM and R, SM, and SM, I mean. that's right. But, but you try SR, which is the smallest real part. I don't know yeah. If that's, so this make is, a difference. It, it shouldn't make a difference because the the eigenvalues of this matrix are supposed to be real. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it should make a difference. That's true. Yeah. So, so that's the vexing part for this part. So I, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, but. I don't think there's anything I, to do with it because it's part of the nature of how those Krylov methods work, right? Sorry, it's part of the nature of how the Krylov method works. Yeah, because it you know finds them by order of magnitude. That's right. Yeah. So I'm I'm not sure about the exercise, like what what exactly they want, the, how 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 what what they had in mind when they made the exercise, but I I tried to count I think, because I, yeah. I I don't know what it looks like here in the middle these dot dot dots here so there's a count command ah. uh, and we we really haven't seen this yet this is something that is basic in R I think we do a boolean and then sort of like we we so we have a vector like x greater than two then sum in R and then then we could count how many are greater than two. So something similar is available in Julia and it's using the count command. And then you have this sort of like a Boolean. And then this is the vector that you want to do the counts for something, something to that effect. And it seems to be three. So I think this is okay for now. Yeah. But that's not, you didn't calculate all the eigenvalues though. Like no, yeah, of course not. It's only okay. for the eigenvalues. The one so there could be, there could be other negative ones in there. There must yeah, be so some that's... other theoretical way to put a bound on it somehow. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So that's the that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry. I was trying to think out loud if there's some way you could turn negatives into big numbers somehow. <laughs> Nothing occurs to me right away. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Another way is you could take the inverse, I guess, but uh... yeah, too big. Uh yeah. 
but but that doesn't solve it solve it either because no. the best you could do is spe you have to specify how many eigenvalues or it will give you a default so it doesn't give you all of them as well so yeah maybe the structure of the matrix is in such a way that the eigenvalues have a particular pattern i i also don't know so that might be subject matter knowledge related to this Hemholtz equation. Yeah. What about using that sigma parameter? Does let me do that? I wonder. Sorry. The sigma parameter, the level shift. Uh, I don't. Is it in the IGS command or in? Yeah. The... Yeah, I'm looking oh. at the documentation. He didn't cover that, I guess. So. Yeah, he sure didn't cover that good. one. Yeah. Not really sure how that would help us either, but. <laughs> Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So we so let me move on to eight point two and eight point three. I combined the two because both of them are about uh, finding eigenvalues uh, in a in a in a targeted way. Okay. So again, the main point is that we may not be. Oh, no, oh, sorry, I hate to interrupt you. He did mention that. Yeah, I said you can find the Higgs sigma, like he has an example. He says find the five closest in value to one in the complex plane via sigma equals one. So there is, that doesn't really help us, but that's what it does, so. <laughs> so it's in the book? Yeah. Or in the, oh. In the, in the book, yeah. I don't see how that helps you at all, tell you the truth. Nearest, <laughs> uh, complex number. yeah. So nearest to zero. That's what it does yeah. by default, but you can see nearest to something else, but it still doesn't help you because. Uh, yeah, because it's some, really some big and negative far away, so. Yeah, if you have a far negative number, it's also hard to find that one for sure, right? Yeah. I wonder what they intended there. Sorry, I keep <laughs> distracted by that. It's vexing. <laughs> you said it. That's the right word. It is vexing. Yeah, it is vexing. So when I, when I was doing it, it's like, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll move on now to okay. 8.2 8 and 8.3. Um, again... Uh, if you're there, there are cases where you're not really interested in all of the eigenvalues. Um, I think um, principal components is one of those uh, situations. Another is sort of like when you do network analysis. I I think there were papers from years ago that talk about uh, uh, looking into the second largest eigenvalue of an adjacency matrix, if I'm not mistaken, but that was so long ago. And it's related to these kinds of small world um, settings. But if you're interested, you can definitely look the, look them up. Uh, that there are situations where you're really interested in a few of the eigenvalues rather than in all of them, okay? And definitely you couldn't do pen and paper for this. Uh, so the suggestion is to do power iteration and in or inverse iteration, okay? So let me just show you the setup for power iteration. And as you can, as you probably could feel, the word power here means that might be that you'll be raising some matrix to some power. Therefore, it's related to what we said earlier about uh, uh, how the density of a, um, of a of a power of a matrix sort of like changes as you increase its power. So the power iteration starts with the diagonalizable uh, n by n matrix. You have n eigenvalues with corresponding eigenvectors v one to v n, and then the the condition one of the conditions is that the there should be a dominant eigenvalue so in this situation it's lambda one notice that there's no equal sign here uh below this greater than sign here okay but you could have repeats of the others but there should be one that is really large okay in absolute value and then the idea is intuitive in the sense that we want to know what happens to eight to the K times X, because if you intuitively, what, what happens here is that the largest eigenvalue becomes, will shine more in, in, in this situation. So let me just see the chat. Ah, let me. Uh, sorry, I was trying not to interrupt you, but I don't do ah. anything. I just realized you could do it with Sigma. What you do is you find out what the largest eigenvalue in, mag in magnitude is, which you already know. Uh -huh. And just call it again, this time asking for all the ones closest to the negative of that. That'll be all the 
those will only be only the negative ones will come up first because I'll be closest to that. Ah, so we'll do it twice in that sense. Yeah. Right? So if you if the biggest one is like five hundred, you go okay. Call again. Sigma equals minus five hundred. Ah. I should give you the the negative first because I'll be closest to that. Ah, makes sense. Makes sense. We'll try. I'll, I'll try that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Sigma. Sorry. Hmm. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. It's kind of like doing a bi like a bisection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thanks for that. Uh, the so so when you raise a to k multiplied by x, you you could imagine that if you have a x a x is equal to lambda times x, right? So for if you want to find the eigenvalues, if you raise a to the to the kth power, uh, eventually you'll have lambda to the second. If you say a square x, it becomes lambda square x and so on. Mm -hmm. So effectively the dominant eigenvalue condition uh, allows you to sort of like magnify the effect of lambda one. So that's what this uh, derivation also points out uh, points out to you. So in a much more formal way, in the sense that A to the K could be written in terms of this uh, VDV transpose uh, form. And uh, and the powers of a matrix are related to VDK to the V. So this is really direct uh, algebra, matrix algebra. And then if you do some work, you'll find that you'll be able to write it as the dominant eigenvalue raised to the kth power times some linear combination of uh, the eigenvectors of the of, of, of these eigenvectors v1 up to vn and then if you if you if you put this lambda 1k to the other side and then subtract off z1 v1 you'll get a part the difference between these two okay the difference between these two, and that's the reason for dividing it, dividing a to the k x by lambda one to the k, and then subtracting off this one, is to get a sense of the difference between these two. Okay, because you want to magnify lambda one to the k, and uh, sorry, you want to you want to magnify the dominant eigenvalue, and you want to know how close these two are. So roughly, a to the k x is effectively like lambda one to the k times x something to that effect. And the remaining part here goes to zero as you push K to infinity, okay? So that's the that's the, um, that's the nice thing about power iteration. And uh, although you get a, a, a denser matrix as you increase K, uh, you, do, you do get something good in return in the sense that you could recover the dominant eigenvalue. And then you have a convergence result that says that the difference between the the esti so beta k here is really the estimated eigenvalue at each iter at the kth iteration, um, subtracted with to the uh, to the dominant eigenvalue. The ratio between errors. Between two iter between two successive iterations is actually a constant ratio, and this constant ratio is the ratio between the second largest eigenvalue and the largest eigenvalue. But again, this result is only a qualitative result at the at best, uh, because you don't know lambda two and lambda one. That's that's what you're trying to find out in the first place. Okay. So that's the that's the point of uh, power iteration, okay, and the convergence result. Now the inverse iteration approach uh, is slightly different and probably a bit more powerful than power iteration because for power iteration you only get to figure recover the dominant eigenvalue. What if you're interested in other eigenvalues, okay? So the there are two two things that I want to point out. The first one is um, let's find the smallest eigenvalue instead. Okay, so if we could do the largest, surely we should be able to do the smallest one. And the idea is that instead of looking at the eigenvalue condition that you've seen before, 
the assumption this time is that you have an ordering where lambda one is the smallest eigenvalue in in absolute value, and then if you take the in if you take the reciprocal of this condition here, okay, you'll find out that the reciprocal is actually you you'll be in the form where you have one over lambda one is the dominant eigenvalue in the context of power iteration. Therefore, you could apply power iteration to A inverse to recover the smallest eigenvalue. That's that's the cool thing about it. But even cooler is that why would we settle for the largest and the smallest if we could get any other eigenvalue? And inverse iteration actually does this by allowing the user to provide a shift S. And I think this is the sigma that, uh, yeah, I think roughly this would be this corresponding to the sigma that uh, Ron was talking about earlier. Uh, and again, it's adjusting and reversing this dominant eigenvalue condition that you see in power iteration into this form. So you have an ordering where you have lambda one minus S uh, sorry, all of these eigenvalues you subtract off s, and then it's in the reverse order. Okay, you might you might feel that why is it that we just don't do the shift in the power iteration? So I'll I'll talk about that later on. But essentially, this is the condition that you need to do, and then you do one over. Okay, you take one over, and uh, that, and then you'll have this dominant eigenvalue condition back again. And then you apply power iteration to A minus S I inverse. And then you'll be able to recover one over lambda one minus S. So you might feel that this is uh, strange, but you could see it from this uh, example here. So uh, these are the eigenvalues in the demo 8.3.4, okay? And suppose, uh, so you have five eigenvalues here. And suppose I put 0.7 as the shift and then take the inverse and then take the absolute value, you will find out that the largest one is this one here. Okay, The largest magnitude is 10.00002, and it corresponds to the eigenvalue 0.6. So what happens is that if you do power iteration where S is equal to 0.7 on a matrix that has this the sets of eigenvalues, you'll be able to recover something that is close to 0.6. So this is 0.6 is not necessarily the largest eigenvalue, not necessarily the smallest eigenvalue, but because of the way the power iteration is, uh, sorry, the, the way inverse iteration was designed with a shift, you'll be able to target specifically 0.6, okay? And you could pretty much do something similar for other shifts. Let's say for S is equal to 0.1, and you could see 10.0 here. So if you have S is equal to 0.1, the one that you will recover by power iteration on A minus SI inverse is actually the eigenvalue zero. Okay. Similarly for S is equal to minus 0.9. So what these illustrations show you is that the shift, you have to have a pretty good idea of what eigenvalue you're looking for. And, uh, and then you pray that the S is near enough to it. You have to set S near enough to it. So, so where that knowledge comes from is probably specific to a, to, to a problem, okay? But that is something that is uh, uh, worth, worth thinking about as well, okay? And I guess the inverse is so you're not dividing by a small number. <laughs> uh, I... I think if you if you do so you so I think it's related to the question of why not why don't we see power iteration with a shift like in the in the usual sense why do we have to do the the inverse well if you if you do minus s here it sort of like preserves the preserves the ordering somehow right so I I think that's that's partly it and then for for if you do this inverse iteration uh somehow using these examples it seems that taking the inverse and then subtracting the shift 
allows you to do the magnification for a specific eigenvalue. So that's the I think that's the best that I could uh think about this uh, or at least express this thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. So that that's the cool that's the cool part. So a, a question here is why would why don't we see power iteration on the a minus si? Why should we do it in a minus si inverse? Yeah. Okay. And again, and I think it's not going to be surprising that convergence is the best when S is close to the target eigenvalue. And but despite despite having this sort of like um, uh, it, it looks a, a very cool kind of idea, uh, the algorithms are not actually very complicated. It's they're relatively easy to to code from scratch. Uh, and you can see it in the in the functions in sections eight point two and eight point three. Um, the new things from Julia are these normalize and find max. Okay, uh, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But the algorithm kind of looks like this. So I show you different algorithms related to power and inverse iteration, and then I marked the points where there's a change. Okay, so for power iteration. It's really, you have to start somewhere, call that X, multiply A to X, calculate this uh, Y, and then you're asked to find the location of the largest entry of Y, and then call that M, and then estimate the dominant eigenvalue as YM divided by XM. You might wonder where this comes from. Well, think about it this way. If you, if you have A times X, then this is equal to lambda one times X, if you're targeting the, the largest eigenvalue. So uh, intuitively, the Y here is a, a vector, uh, an N by one vector, and then you have lambda one times X, which is also an N by one vector. And you have an entry that is Y one, let's say the first entry is Y sub one, and then lambda one times X, the first entry is lambda one times X one. So if you want lambda one, then it's really like y one divided by x one, something like that. So, you, what is not very obvious to me is why should we look at the location of the largest entry where we could get any other, uh, you could you could choose any other locate any other location and estimate the eigenvalue in pretty much the same way. So. So, but I think, I, I I guess the idea is that if you want the largest, you want the dominant one, so it might make sense to look at the, lo the location of the largest entry. So that's uh, how I could rationalize it. Yeah. I think it's because you need to find the location of the largest one to do the normalization, the next bullet down there, um, right? To keep the, keep Y from exploding over re every iteration. Mm -hmm. so since you've already got that, you might as well use it. Also, I think it'd be more numerically stable, right? Because you're taking the, dividing by the biggest number you can find <laughs> for the yeah. small number. Yeah, so that, that also makes sense. Yeah, that also makes sense. So uh, the, this is more of like me wondering like, okay, I, I could also use any other entry anyway. Or so, the sum of them or anything, right? Yeah, so but it, but but what you mentioned is makes that's a that's a good point because at some point you'll be dividing by 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 y sub m so yeah that makes sense so that and then once you estimate the dominant eigenvalue you you create a new eigenvector estimate uh and it would be the y that you got from the second step divided by y sub m and then you collect the trail. Essentially, that's the the steps for the power iteration and the algorithm that you see in the in the text is roughly like this. And then if you do inverse iteration, the only thing that will change is because you're doing power iteration for a inverse, then this a here becomes a inverse. But you don't want to invert a matrix, so you put this on the other side, and that's why you see a y equals x here, and then. Because of the because you're doing inverse iteration, the dominant eigenvalue is estimated not as y divided by x, but rather x divided by y. That's the only thing that will those are the only things that will change. Okay. 
if you want to do inverse iteration, finding the eigenvalue with the smallest magnitude. And a point that uh, that they make is that we don't, the, the step here of uh, solving for Y here doesn't have to be done repeatedly because the A stays fixed. The A matrix stays fixed. So it's possible to, so, so you could improve the algorithm by storing a factorization of A and you can see it as one of the, one of the lines in the, in the code. And then if you use inverse iteration with a user specified shift S, what are the things that will change? It's again, those same two steps that will change, okay? So instead of A times Y, you have A minus S I, and then instead of estimated in the, the dominant eigenvalue by X divided by Y, you, you undo the shift. So you, you add S and essentially that's it. If you specify S in advance, this a minus s i stays fixed, but the section also explores the possibility of an updated s. So if you update s, then you have to solve this system of equations in every iteration. So that's what they call uh, dynamic shifting. Okay, and the idea is to use the latest eigenvalue estimate to update the value of s because because the S is the one where you, you want S to be close to the target eigenvalue. So that's the only source of information that you have. The latest eigenvalue estimate is use, you could use the, you could feed that into S. And there's no way to avoid the repeated factorization. Uh, again, trade-offs, uh, it does create some numerical problems. You could see it illustrated in the book, but it requires fewer iterations. Okay. So I think that, Good. yeah, go ahead. I think in the demo, for I was just checking back yeah. about our comment about M. They just used the first in a demo. 8.5, yeah, they, they, used... they yeah, just they right. were like, just use one. <laughs> yeah, that's the one, right? Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. So there must be something like Ron was saying, numeric stability about, use like some theory about using M. Hmm. that's right and yeah, it, I just think it's the idea you want to avoid like any zeros or anything like that right so that's one way you can make sure you avoid a zero or something really small even not zero right for so use that's right one. that's probably a good way to avoid it <laughs> yeah I, I i i agree i agree so yeah they they really didn't talk so much about it and then they they throw you this this thing they don't use it yeah that's funny yeah, I, actually, at first when I was doing when I when I haven't seen this example, I was I, I thought about it and said, well, I could have used any other entry as well. So and then and then suddenly in eight point three, I thought, oh, you've done it. <laughs> so yeah, that's funny. Yeah, so there. So sorry, it was a bit. I think it can be. It these two sections can be a bit overwhelming, but this is the sort of the core of it, um, and then. The exercises are really, some are, are boring in the sense that they are really repeating some of the code that you've seen before, uh, but some are quite interesting. Uh, for 8.2.1a, uh, they're asked to, the matrix A here is a two by two. So I, I could solve the true eigenvalues by hand. So I could do this, uh, convergence result. I could get a sense of this convergence result. But the other matrices in that exercise are, I, I couldn't do it by hand anymore, or at least I don't have the patience to do it by hand. Um, they didn't mention that you could use eigenvals at least at this point. So it was only when I was reading the next few sections that I, the remaining sections that I realized that, oh, I, I could just use eigenvalues and th this will be the true ones. Uh, so so that, that could be an approach for that section in case uh, people will be discouraged doing it by hand. Um, and another thing that um, that the book does is that they look at the errors they they don't necessarily look at the ratio 
of beta k plus one minus lambda one divided by beta k minus lambda one. Instead, they're looking at the, the difference between successive iterations instead. So that's something uh, of note. So that's why I did some work here to match what they were trying to do in reality. And uh, it's also quite nice because the the difference between successive, the, the, the difference in the estimates between two successive iterations of the power iteration algorithm is actually the the error in the previous step times the relative difference between lambda two and lambda one. So it's it's quite nice as well. Um, and for this example, what happens is that the the errors get halved. Okay, so if you if you if you try to put this num these two numbers in here in this in this uh, growth, if you wish, a growth rate or or a percentage difference, uh, it's really a half. You have uh, you cut the errors by half every in every iteration, and you could see you kind of see it uh, in the output. Okay, but it's a, a little bit slow. Uh, after twenty iterations, we're in e minus eight, which not so bad, not so bad. And then another interesting exercise is 8.2.2, uh, where you'll you're asked to look into a violation of the dominant eigenvalue condition. Okay, uh, at least that's what I thought the intention of the exercise was, and it's this um, uh, deceptively simple matrix here. Uh, the eigenvalues here are one minus one, so yeah. definitely the dominant eigenvalue condition is not satisfied. Okay. Um, and then you're asked to describe what happens if you do power iteration for this uh, for this matrix. Um, so what I did here was I adjusted the power iteration code to have a user specified initial input because the input for power iteration is a random it's a it's a random vector that is normalized. So what I did here was to give a user specified input so modify it accordingly um and then there's and then in as i described what is happening to uh what is happening in this in this context the code that you will see actually foreshadows the krylov krylov methods uh at least the the core idea behind krylov method <sighs> So what I so what I did here was to look at the history of the eigenvectors that were generated at each iteration. And what happens is that the eigenvector sort of like flip here and there. Yeah, that's the that's essentially what's happening here. And this history for the eigenvec eigenvectors is really multiplying A repeatedly. So you see powers of A showing up again and then collecting all of them together in in this uh in this two by eight matrix at least for this uh for this context the act of starting somewhere multiplying by a and then multiplying by a repeatedly allows you to generate what is called a Krylov uh subspace and you'll see it in 8.4 and then you could see that if you do power iteration, uh, power iteration for for this matrix, you don't recover the the correct eigenvalues. You also don't get the corresponding eigenvector as well. So you see, you get one point seventy five every time, rather than one or minus one. So this is definitely a failure of. Uh, uh, power iteration because the dominant eigenvalue condition is not satisfied. Um, the <clears throat> the remaining part eight point two point three is really this Helmholtz um, inspired matrix. I think I might skip this this part. Um, let me see if there's something that is vexing about this one. I don't think there's something really vexing about this one, uh, but they do mention that the curves here look weird because there are repeated eigenvalues. Okay, that's about it.
the interesting one is 8.2.5 where you could get a a convergence uh improvement speed of convergence improvement uh, by using this uh rally quotient uh mentioned in seven in chapter seven uh and then you're asked to create a new function that incorporates this uh rally co uh rally quotient and yeah, you, the they specify that your function should not introduce any additional matrix vector multiplications. Um, I what I did here was that because I get I have to calculate a x anyway already, so I already have that. The remaining part is really calculating dot products. I'm not sure if if calculating those dot products uh, violates the spirit of this restriction. But uh, that's the best that I could do. Uh, I I just calculate the dot products of x with the y that was calculated before, and then a dot product of x and x. That will give me the an estimate of the eigenvalue uh, using the Raleigh quotient. Okay. And uh, let me just show you that indeed. Uh, well, it's not very obvious here. But I think I think you could already see it in the in the axes. The convergence is quite fast for the rally modification. Okay, here you started about one thousand five hundred. Here it's already one hundred twenty five. The error, so it's relatively fast. Uh, the convergence is relatively fast. Okay, but they ultimately ultimately they would reach uh, uh convergence in pretty much. 100 iterations here okay um i also want to mention that it's hard to do the log scale here because some of the errors are negative okay even if yeah so th therefore you have to do this absolute value make sure that you have to take this absolute value part here okay i tried to control the user input in terms of the initial vector so that I could have a same starting point rather than have a randomized starting point for both, just for comparison's sake. Yeah, I think that, that's that's about it for, for now. I don't have enough time to go to 8.4, but uh, the remaining exercises are, are also quite nice. There's a part about dynamic shifting. Uh, I also have that here. It's a simple modification as well. Uh, and then I'll, I think next week I'll start with 8.4, okay? Which is also a very cool topic. Uh, so hope I hope you'll join us for that one. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Awesome. Yeah, yeah this is really great. Thanks. <sighs> Did a lot of exercises. I'm gonna have to. I know, I was thinking that too. Like, man, when do you find the time? I'm like, I like <laughs> exercise. Yeah. It, it really takes a, a lot more time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let, let, let me put end first here. Um, Appreciate it.